Hello, everyone. Welcome back to CTM 2021 Transformation. Today is the second day of our discourse program, and this is the third and, special fin um, third and final session of the day. For those joining us for the first time, my name is Ali Zhang. I am one of the discourse curators here at CTM. The constantly shifting terrain of AI has been an area of inquiry for the festival for some years now. Um, I'm really pleased today that we'll be joined by a number of thinkers doing really crucial work in the field. This next session will be hosted by Tiara Roxanne, who is an indigenous cyber feminist scholar and artist based in Berlin. Her research and artistic practice investigates the encounter between the indigenous body and AI. More particularly, she explores the colonial structures embedded within artificial intelligence learning systems, uh, both through her writing and her performance art through textile. As always, please feel free to send over questions for our speakers via the YouTube chat or via Streamback on our website. And yeah, now I'll pass it on over to Tiara to introduce the speakers in session. Thank you, Ollie, for the introduction. And thank you, everyone, for bearing with us for the delay. Um, as Ali said, I am Tiara Roxanne, an indigenous woman of Tadaskan Mestiza heritage. Here, I sit from Studio DB Berlin, wearing two beaded earrings in the colors blue and orange made by my grandmother on my father's side. My grandmother, Catherine, who is here in the room with us now, gracing our presence with Tadaskan energy. I also wear a gold chain necklace, which you cannot see, holding two engraved hearts to represent my sister, Desiree, and myself with a rose in the middle a necklace worn by my mama from my childhood. My mama I carry with me always and the ancestors who brought me here in this present moment to feel honored to be here at CETAM. As a moderator for the panel, Mutating Hazards, New Threats and Injustices in AI. I have been visiting CTM Festival for the past few years and I'm thrilled to moderate the very cool and important presentations to follow. The panel more specifically will discuss injustices in AI. As such, counter to common silicone myths, the development of new technologies is never objective, detached, detached nor, nor neutral. What is termed artificial intelligence is thus entangled in many political questions. What is the artificial? And how does that differentiate from the human? How can the human be defined in the first place? And what is its role in relationship to AI? What are the implications of different cosmologies on technological developments and design? Given the fervor surrounding new machine learning tools and innovations, as well as their widespread adoption, the area demands critical engagement. Per the environment of our live stream, please again bear with us if we have any technical dif difficulties, lags, or delays. We are thankful for your presence and excited to get started. With that said, I'm happy to introduce our first speaker, Maya Indira Ganesh, who is a tech and digital culture theorist, researcher, and writer. She works across academia, arts and cultural organizations, and civil society organizations. She is completing a doctorate of philosophy that will be awarded by the cultural studies faculty, Lufana University, Lundberg, Germany. In nine days, her doctoral research work examines the political, economic, and cultural shaping of ethics in the becoming human of machines and vice versa. Prior to this, she worked at the intersection of gender justice, digital activism, and international development in India and Southeast East Asia. Please welcome Maya. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for making time to be with us today. And I'm so honored and happy to be in conversation with these fellow travelers, Tiara, Sabello, and Jason. And I really look forward to speaking with them today. So it's been four months since I made a presentation. We're in lockdown here in Berlin, and I'm really grateful for the means to be able to get out of my house and come here and make this presentation. So I really want to thank CTM 
uh, and all the people who've uh, worked so hard to put this together and to keep us safe in this space. So my work is about material cultures and knowledge cultures. I enjoy the space between them. I work as a technology researcher, and I understand AI as such, as material technology with specific histories, as a knowledge apparatus, and because of its particular history, it provokes a particular kind of distressed reflection in how we architect and understand the world. I've also spent most of my adult life, all of my adult life, working in movements and collectives, feminist, queer, and about information and digital technologies. Which is all to say that something titled Poetics and Politics is entirely my jam. I'm sure that many people have used this juxtaposition, but I quite like the one that infrastructure scholar Brian Larkin developed, saying that there's a stickiness between the purely technical functioning and the concrete semiotic and aesthetic, that systems like AI are much more than just technical objects. They are also carriers of desire and fantasy and take on fetish-like aspects. Thanks to the Bagrun Institute in California and the Rockefeller Foundation for supporting this work that I'm going to talk about today, AI Metaphors. It fits into and is continuous with a larger body of work that I've been doing over the past few years about how we make knowledge and technology, in this case AI. How do particular technologies come to have discursive power to influence how we think about them? What kinds of languages and representations do they make? Who makes them? And how do they become legitimate? So for example, last year, I started this um, sort of digital interactive pedagogical product, project, A is for another.net. You can look at it online. I'm not going to go into it in a lot of detail. Uh, as a kind of epistemic disruption or deconstruction of what we know as these building blocks of artificial intelligence, these ideas of intelligence and humanness and machine. And um, my point in this uh, and in the metaphors project that I'm going to talk about is to say that what happens to AI when we look at it through the perspective of some other kind of knowledge, like Korean or feminist or non-human? So when I talk about the metaphors of AI, I want to complicate the idea that it is something unique or special or different and recognize that it exists as multiple things and also in very different places in different ways. I think that the local cannot be understated uh, because AI is also sort of positioned as this general universal technology. And I think we come, it, it comes at a moment, however, when something is different and powerful in our technologies and their place in society. So we're sort of like um, grappling with these uh, multiple contradictions when we use the words AI. And when I say politics and poetics, I am referring to the political economic and histories in different political geographies, because AI is also business now. It's enterprise technology. But at the same time, then this is the other part of the entanglement. These language and concepts through which we make meaning provoke different kinds of philosophical reflections in different parts of the world. So, um, so with that, um, and that's the thing with, with metaphors, and that's why they're so interesting. We use metaphors all the time. Much of our thinking is organized around metaphors. In fact, AI itself is a metaphor for what we think intelligence is. Metaphors allow us to navigate the new and things we cannot comprehend that are uncertain. This is pretty common in science because we're always coming up against things that are unfamiliar and that are hard to describe. So what happens then is that the more we use particular kinds of language, ideas to talk about things, they start to constitute reality. And we can only start to talk in those terms then. And this becomes the paradox, particularly when we come up against things that feel new and unfamiliar. So it prevents us from seeing the future, the future unfolding in its entirety and in any other way but in terms of these metaphors. And, there, and I mean, you're familiar with a lot of the metaphors that we use already with technology. Information just wants to be free, or cybersecurity as infection, as disease, or this idea of digital detox and addiction to refer to our struggles to deal with the attention economy. Uh, and data as oil, which you see in this, um, this great chart. Or there's the metaphor of the black box, which has become a site for social research about AI, chiefly as something that can be opened up and made transparent. So in this view, AI is industrial technology that can and must be regulated. But a black box can also be something that's threatening, affective, libidinal. In this other register of the black box, we might want to handle it differently instead of ripping it open. 
The black box actually emerges from Skinnerian behaviorist psychology that perceives the human mind as the ultimate black box, one that can be manipulated by external levers to certain desired effects, but without ever really needing to or being able to understand what goes on inside. I find this really unsettling. So here's the thing, metaphors do not, I'm not saying that they reveal some kind of ground truth, but that we are talking, but how we're talking about things is shaped and contained by and is limited to these metaphors and where they come from. So I think these social fingerprints on metaphors are really important and who gets to make them. So if we look at, for example, the physicist Max Tegmark, founder of the Future of Life Institute, describes AI as a rising sea of intelligence, but unfortunately with no reference to climate change um, that threatens to swamp human ability. So in this, in this perception, like everything from go to art is set in a hierarchy, and AI threatens to creep up on the special thing, human ability. Or if we look at neural networks, these are vision, this, this, I, I really like this chart, it's so colorful. It makes you feel like you can really understand what a convolutional neural network is. These are but just visual representations of mathematical functions that we understand as being neural, as brain-like, as if our brains functioned a little like computers. And if they didn't, well, now it's too late to think of anything else, because I feel that we are so far down the road of computer and brain metaphors that it is hard to imagine ourselves in any other way. But I think there was a time when we did not think of our brains as information processing machines. And that's the power of metaphors. We think that metaphors are, have an anatomy, uh, that it is root, rooted in the earth and, that has, and has a body that can be dissected and understood. Or we think it's automated decision making uh, and that it's already here. This is actually a photograph thanks to uh, the writer Tim Mon, who took it uh, as part of an Unknown Fields exhibition, and this is a container port in Ningbo in China. Um, and he says, Skynet is real, and it wants to sell you shoes made by child slaves. So it's not even something that's in the future, it's already here. So moving to the project that uh, I've been doing over the last few months, uh, along with a fantastic bunch of nine students, and um, I've done a bunch of interviews with people, uh, so, so as I'm speaking, I'm also sort of channeling the work and pulling together the work of uh, many other people, not just, not just myself. So what I did specifically was um, try to look at uh, AI metaphors in these contexts. There are uh, nine languages in 13 countries. And perhaps the most distinctive feature of AI is the binary at its heart, that AI could go either this way or that, threaten or strengthen human society. And as a threat to humanity has its champions in top scientists and entrepreneurs. On the other hand, AI is a technology that supports and helps humans become more creative, productive, and efficient. And this is, by large, you know, this is the larger sort of dominant uh, metaphor cluster because this is the direction of business development that you know, AI is something that's going to make uh, humanity and society more efficient and creative. There's a long-standing tradition of technology and automation to help humans and AI, that uh, humans that AI piggybacks on. So in Israel, AI might be something like the Shabbos Goy, a non-Jew who can perform particular tasks on behalf of Jews on the day of rest. And then we found a text from Germany in 1978 where there's a reference to AI as the Heinzelmännchen or house or a house gnome that does the work around the house. But as I was saying, AI is business and profit, and that is really key, and that's where a lot of metaphors come from. So in Spain, it's referred to as gold fever or fiebre de oro, even though concerns about, you know, there are concerns about things like machine learning and bias. The gold is data, of course. But large, populous countries like India hope to capitalize on this data gold as the fuel for AI. I was listening to an online webinar recently uh, as, as part of this project where a South African bureaucrat was enth enthusiastic about how data-rich Africa can leverage AI technologies to catch up, presumably with the West. AI has become a buzzword. And I was talking to some Indian designers who said that this is how the tech industry there thinks about it. AI is like the Bollywood star Shah Rukh Khan. You need to have it in there to bring in the big bucks. Or it is the train for countries in the global south, the train you want to catch. AI transforms into a new kind of clock or meter of progress and development that circumvents the past, 
to catapult poorer nations into a brighter future. AI is a tech that Southern policymakers think will end hunger or solve poverty, for example. The funny thing is they thought this about televisions and mobile phones and the internet and big data. And as ludicrous as the idea is that AI will solve social problems, there is also an understanding that I get in my discussions with people that it is not so special, spectacular, or particularly threatening. It is just the next big tech opportunity. However, some African experts do tell me that uh, the possibilities and promises that are being invested in data and AI will never redound to actual Africans' benefits as long as governments continue to function as inefficient and corrupt bureaucracies that stymie actual innovation. Or India that will position itself as both lab and garage to the world, and which are very different kinds of spaces. And while it's off being lab and garage for the world, India becomes an entirely inhospitable home for its own citizens. I like to think of this steampunk vision of Prime Minister Modi, this ascetic, leading into a, India into a shining future. But at the same time, he's also activated a base that lives somewhere in some fake past of Hindu glory. So there's a lot of time travel going on with AI, which is about inhabiting the past and the future at the same time. And the, and the same metaphor can mean the, the different things. So the train metaphor about catching up with the West, um, it's used in a very different register in the context of, let's say, highly automated weapon systems. When you analyze what policymakers or bureaucrats are saying there, um, that's a train that's already left. They say it has left the station. It is done. And moving on to different sets of metaphors, uh, mostly to do with automation and work. Whether you look at Metropolis, Fritz Lang's film from 1927, or Sleep Dealer, Alex Rivera's in 2008, cinema shapes and reflects Anglo-European anxieties about automation, robots, and work. There are serious intellectual and policy efforts on to study how automation might generate new work arrangements, and particularly in the COVID-19 context, and consider what humans might do if we had more time for leisure. But for the most part, there's a concern that automation will threaten job security and stability. It becomes a narrative about robots taking away human jobs rather than acknowledging that humans are being displaced to take on new work with increasing automation. As automation theorist Aaron Beninav argues, what this metaphor hides is that the jobs are just not there to be taken away. The problem is not technological change, but a decades-long marinade of economic stagnation, austerity, and the defunding of social and public infrastructure. I was doing an interview with the German media theorist who told me that there was a review done of the Spiegel covers, the German magazine, um, a review of these covers over four decades. And across four decades, there was the same narrative, the same metaphor of AI and white-colored robots. Over 40 years, AI was found to threaten German jobs. However, is this really about robots taking away jobs, or that the German state and economy is organized around the promise of security and welfare and employment? Robots taking away jobs ends up appearing as a metaphor for German anxiety about its own identity in a changed world, perhaps, rather than of AI. Similarly, South Korea's ambivalence about AI being potentially more than or less than human as gorilla or superhuman is indicative of its concerns about internet technologies broadly. The country has always struggled with distinguishing itself from its authoritarian northern counterpart, so it does not want to regulate tech too much, but also doesn't want to be too lax. And finally, I want to talk about the Japanese perception of AI and robots. That's a significant outlier, and you have to see it as a sort of, um, th this narrative of robots as a lightning rod or a red herring, especially in the context of the moral panic of work, because the reality of work is different in different economic contexts. So the Japanese economic boom of the 1980s and 90s, when robotics moved from being an industrial research project to central in the, to, the, to their new digital economy. This was when the figure of the salary man came to the fore in the news and in pop culture, the white collar worker who was dehumanized to the point of dying from overwork. There's a great and terrifying film about this, Tetsuo, Iron Man, where you see this blurring of human into robotic worker that is not just about merging with the machine, but perhaps about the dystopian reality of living within an economy that itself is a relentless machine. But it's also interesting to recognize that Japan's demogra demographics changed significantly over the 20th century. Life expectancy increased, and it has strongly resisted immigration. 
So the population ages and fewer younger Japanese care for their elderly. So robotics needs to develop to a high enough level to work in everyday situations such as cleaning or to more intimate situations of care and companionship. This might be part of the reason why robots are not presented as not human. Instead, they're considered to be more like friends or innocent, like children are. Astro Boy, the 1950s fictional character, remains a source of inspiration in robotics and for roboticists. An android boy who cares for humans and in which the emotional gap between human and robot is one of sweet poignancy rather than pathos and horror. So you have a robot called Pepper, a social interactive robot that's used in elder care, inspired by Astro Boy, who is responsive but also flawed like a small boy might be. So to have this small boy watch over and take care of his grandparents is not considered to either take away from or award humanness in either direction. In fact, that robots are built to mimic or respond to humans is considered positive in Japan. By contrast, North Atlantic traditions regard the human as the pinnacle of civilization and unique. Hence, anything that approaches this is first considered a threat and then must carefully be studied before it is included in the category of the human. So if there are many countries that want to catch up and others uncertain of whether they could or they should, two countries are well ahead of the curve. China and the US both have significant investments, talents, innovation, and are very much the same actually in terms of all of the negatives, rating people, surveillance, privacy violations. But what I find distinguishes the two is the poet different poetics in the understanding of the human in the world. To the, in the Chinese, context, AI is positioned as a tool, something useful to improve human life and make societies creative, productive, and efficient. The US has that view as well, but while it is supposed to make humans more creative and efficient, there's always this lurking fear, a threat of the destabilization of the human. You could say that the Chinese do not put, are not putting that much stock in something special to the human soul. Nature and other non-humans are as powerful and distinct as the human, just different. And I could say a lot more about these two countries, uh, but I won't for now, and I hope to actually publish something about this work soon. I want to end with something from Susan Sontag's Illness as Metaphor, which she writes with a view to her own history of cancer, which I think is quite apt for the present moment. She says that one of the human experiences that is quite radically not metaphorical is illness. And yet at the same time, quote, to take up residence in the kingdom of the ill is to be subject to lurid metaphors." Unquote. She persuades us that the healthiest way to be ill is to resist metaphoric thinking. And in a moment overshadowed by death and illness, climate catastrophe and economic precarity, I think it's necessary to reflexively assess how AI is being molded as it becomes integrated into more and more domains, ostensibly to improve or better human society, which is not homogenous nor uniform. So what betterment and human and society, what these words mean and to whom must always be up for discussion and reflection. Thank you. Thank you, Maya, um, for this very cool talk on metaphors in AI, AI in labor, and so forth. Uh, I'm really excited to, uh, to discuss more further um, with you later and the rest of the panelists. Uh, for now, I will move forward to our next speaker, Jason Edward Lewis, who is a digital media theorist, poet, and software designer. He founded the OBX Laboratory for Experimental Media, where he conducts research, creation projects, exploration of computation as a creative and cultural material. He directs the Initiative for Indigenous Futures, and co-directs the Indigenous Futures Research Center, the Indigenous Protocol and AI Workshops, the Aboriginal Territories and Cyberspace Research Network, and the Skins Workshop on Aboriginal Storytelling and Video Game Design. Jason is deeply committed to developing intriguing new forms of expression by working on conceptual, creative, critical, and technical levels simultaneously. He is the University Research Chair in Computational Media and the Indigenous Future Imaginary, as well as Professor of Computation Arts 
at Concordia University, Montreal. He was born and raised in Northern California, and he is Hawaiian and Samoan. Let us now welcome Jason. Hello, everybody. I hope you're all doing well out there, despite the current crazy in the world. I want to start off by thanking Ollie for the invitation to speak with you all today, and Amelie for her support in making this happen. And I want to thank you, the audience, as well, for lending me your sharp ears and your good minds for the next 20 minutes. I hope you're all doing okay out there uh, as we trudge and, and maybe even dance a little our, of our way through this global pandemic. I'm recording this video from Jojage, known in settler Canada as Montreal, on the traditional territory of the Ganyagahaga Nation. I wish to express my gratitude to the Ganyagahaga for welcoming me to live on their territory, and I hope that my words today carry both illumination and respect for my circle of relations. I'm going to talk today about how we might consider the challenge of artificial intelligence in terms of kinship relations. I'm interested in how such an approach might transform not only our understanding of AI, but of all of our computational technologies. This is a short talk. I'm covering a lot of ground. It's going to go fast, so buckle in. I want to open with a quick blast from the past. This is a video of an, on, uh, of an online interactive piece that I created with my now wife, the artist Scavanati almost two decades ago, a little bit ago. We conceived of it as an addendum uh, to the Iroquois Thanksgiving address. Scalinade is Iroquois, a Mohawk from the Ganawage uh, community near Montreal and a member of the Ganyagahaga Nation that I mentioned in my opening acknowledgement. The Thanksgiving address is a piece of oration used to, among other things, give thanks to all the things in the world that sustain us and which we must help sustain. Scalinade and I want traditional list of things from the natural world, uh, things like the waters and plants and animals and stars, um, and uh, new entities that reflected what we were thankful for as indigenous people entering the 21st century. So let me play some of it for you. The audio and video quality is not that great, but remember, it's old. Cut it some slack. Today we have gathered to thank the creator for all our gifts. We have been given the duty to live in balance and harmony with each other and all technological things. So now, we bring our minds together as one and we give greetings and thanks. We are all thankful for the computer, the platform from which we can create and communicate. Daily, this tool enriches our lives. For this, we send greetings and thanks now our minds are one. We give thanks for TCPIP. With it, our computers can talk to each other across the continents and across cultures. Whether it's our voices speaking, our language typing, or our eyes seeing, TCPIP guides the data where it needs to go. Packets are sent out. Packets are received. All is in order. For this, we give thanks. Now our minds are one. We give thanks to the Internet, which allows us to be connected to each other, forming a web across our Mother Earth. We know its power in many forms, email, chat, newsgroups. With one mind, we send greetings and thanks to the spirit of the Internet. Now our minds are one. We send greetings and thanks for C++ and Java and all other programming languages. They provide us with the means to speak intimately with our computers, to instruct them on in how to transform electricity into information and emotion. Through them occurs the everyday magic of transubstantiating the word into form. Now our minds are one. We turn our minds to digital imaging hardware, the scanners, digital still cameras, and digital video cameras. They transform the analog images of our world into the digital data of the computer world. They let us show each other what is in our minds and in our hearts. For these, we send our greetings and thanks. Now our minds are one. We give thanks to the PIC chip and basic stamp 
for they allow us to connect the virtual and the physical. They expand the senses we can make available to our computers, allowing them to sense somebody's breath or move objects around. We are grateful for their power and simplicity. So this interactive artwork captures an underlying theme of what I've been doing for the last 20 years, which is trying to figure out the productive intersections between indigenous culture and computational technology. The core question then is the same question now. How do we operate from a position of deep respect for indigenous ways of living, ways of knowing, and ways of creating while engaging with technologies that often have their roots in worldviews that have been used to subjugate, assimilate, and erase us? In other words, how do we assert sovereignty over these technologies even as they resist us? The video is an early experiment in how indigenous teachings, in this case, one aimed at reminding us of our interrelationship with all those things that sustain the world around us, uh, and first formulated hundreds if not thousands of years ago, uh, can be used to inform how we approach technology today. Since we made that video, I've worked on a number of projects that continue these experiments of integrating traditional knowledge with computation and digital media. These include Aboriginal Territories in Cyberspace, or Abtech, which looks at how old stories could be retold in new media. The Skins workshops on Aboriginal storytelling and digital media design, where we work with Indigenous youth to build capacity within our communities for designing, creating, and using digital technology and the Initiative for Indigenous Futures, which explores how Indigenous people can create future imaginaries to help them anticipate how they want their communities to evolve, including how current and future technologies can be developed to best suit their needs. And that brings me here today to talk about the latest iteration of this exploration of Indigenous culture and computational technology. In 2018, I wrote an essay with three colleagues, Dr. Noelani Arista, uh, who was at the University of Hawaii at Manoa at the time in the history department, Arch Pachawis, who is a Cree multimedia artist and media theorist based in Toronto, and Suzanne Kite, a Lakota performance artist and PhD student uh, who works with me. Titled Making Kin with the Machines, the essay was an attempt to articulate indigenous perspectives on artificial intelligence. Seeing the ever-growing ubiquity of these technologies, the biases that infest them, and the intellectually cramped and um, experientially impoverished notions mainstream AI seem to have of both what is human and what is intelligence, we thought it useful to take a critical approach to the Western anthropocentric worldview that shapes that mainstream AI view. We argued that for, uh, that uh, we argued for a different approach, one that emphasizes relationality with each other and with non-humans, and that de-emphasizes the uniqueness and privilege of the human. So we write, we believe that indigenous epistemologies are much better at respectfully accommodating the non-human. We retain a sense of community that is articulated through complex kin networks anchored in specific territories, genealogies, and protocols. Ultimately, our goal is that we, as a species, figure out how to treat these new non-human kin respectfully and reciprocally. So let me unpack this a little as there are sort of several things going on at once. First, there's the idea that we should think of non-humans as kin. One way to understand that is we need to understand our relationship with and dependency on other animals, the plants, the waters, the earth. Second, there is a recognition of AI systems specifically as non-human kin. Even in the weak form they exist in now, and certainly in the stronger forms that they may exist in the future. And third, there's a call to develop protocols that recognize these kinships, support the relationships between different kinds of kin, and seek to balance the thriving of all entities in the circle of relations. Uh, this includes protocols embedded in our computational technology. So the Making Kin with the Machines essay inspired the four of us to bring together some of our peers to have a broader and deeper discussion about the intersections between indigenous thought and artificial intelligence. So in collaboration with Angie Abdilla, a Troll Wulwe, a designer based in Sydney, and OEV Parker-Jones, a Hawaiian neuroscientist conducting research at Oxford, we put on two workshops in the winter and spring of 2019. These were called the Indigenous Protocol and Artificial Intelligence Workshops. We brought together indigenous technologists, artists, scientists, cultural knowledge holders, language keepers, and public policy experts to discuss the opportunities that AI presents as well as the possible perils. 
We chose the term indigenous protocol because of the emphasis in many native cultures on doing things in the right way, with the right way being the way which strengthens our circle of relations with other humans and with non-humans. We also chose protocol because it has distinct meanings in the sciences and engineering that also refer to the valid method for accomplishing a task. The group came from a multitude of disciplines in the arts, design, engineering, science, and community-based knowledges, and was deeply committed to the notion that any discussion of intelligence take place within a multidisciplinary context. We produced a position paper published last July, includes 14 long form and 18 short form original contributions that range from the technical to the fantastical, incorporating scholarly articles, essays, poetry, artwork, and technological prototypes. To give you a small taste, here's some of the text inside. So uh, this is uh, one of them is by Scott Bennett in Abandon, who is an uh, artist. Uh, he wrote a short story called Gwizens, the old lady in the octop octopus bag device a short story which he uses to think through what it might mean to bring AI into Anishinaabe uh, sort of kind of cultural uh, uh, landscape and story practice. There's Suzanne Kite's How to Build Anything Ethically essay where she uses Lakota protocol for building a sweat lodge to propose a step-by-step -step process for ethically building AI. There's my own quartet piece, imagining a future where young Hawaiians would be raised alongside three AIs one that views reality as a series of, processing, of processes always in flux, one oriented to caring for land and family while maintaining abundance for all kin, and one based on the distributed neuroanatomy of the octopus that translates between the first two and the young person. And there's the uh, Hua Ki'i language translation app that Michael and Caroline uh, Running Wolf developed along with uh, uh, Caleb Moses, Joel Taylor, and Noah Lani Arista. Uh, and this combined machine language techniques with a method of crowdsourcing Hawaiian translations to create a mobile app where uh, user, the user could use their phone to look at objects and get the community verified Hawaiian translation for that object. It also features a first pass at guidelines for indigenous-centered AI design. The guidelines include uh, locality, AI systems should be designed in partnership with specific indigenous communities, relationality and reciprocity, AI systems should be designed to understand how humans and non-humans are related to and interdependent on each other, responsibility, relevance, and accountability, AI systems developed by, with, or for indigenous communities should be responsible to those communities, governance guidelines based on indigenous protocols. So there's a need to adapt existing protocols and develop new protocols for designing, building, and deploying AI systems. Recognition of the cultural nature of all computational technology. Uh, as uh, Dr. Fox Harrell says, all technical systems are cultural and social systems, which means that all technical systems are riddled with assumptions about humans behave with one another. Uh, ethical design for the extended stack. Ethics doesn't begin at deployment. Uh, it begins with building, and it doesn't end with uh, with uh, disposal. It ends with how the materials inside get rendered back to the earth. And respect and support data sovereignty. Indigenous communities must control how their data is solicited, collected, analyzed, and operationalized. So I'd like to finish by showing you a short video. It's the trailer describing one of our skin's workshops on Aboriginal storytelling and video game design. Uh, these are three-week intensive workshops with Indigenous youth where we braid together local Indigenous culture with technical training and the tools needed to create video games with discussions about the use of Indigenous knowledge in 21st century contexts. This particular workshop was held in Honolulu, Hawaii in 2017.
The participants in this workshop named their game Heiahu, or A New World, uh, a reminder, as the video states, of all the new worlds we can create when we work together for our future while staying rooted in our languages and traditions. So this is the approach I hope we can take with building artificial intelligence systems. Work directly with local communities, listen to the stories they tell that communicate their values and challenges, build technology that addresses their needs, and tell new stories about those technologies. We all come from people who had to innovate continuously to stay alive and live in balance with our environment. We are still here because our ancestors were intelligent, inspired, and took care of their kin. So to paraphrase Chai Mamanda Adijite, the danger is and always has been relying on one story about how that happened. The AI story is one story at the moment, a continuation of the story of Western white supremacy told through the modes of capitalism, colonialism, and monotheism. But it could be a story of connection, care, and abundance if we have the will to make it so. Mahalo. Jason, thank you. That was incredible. Um, I'm so happy that there are indigenous initiatives existing across the globe, um, that you are taking care and taking part in thinking about indigenous futures, holding space for workshops and teaching and um, spaces for creativity and imagining. I cannot wait to talk further about the expansiveness, um, the oppositions of that, and what it might look like moving forward um, for you beyond design. So thank you so much. Like that video made me hungry. I like wanted some food. I wanted some fam time. I got some dance in and I'm inspired. So thank you so much. Now we get to move on to our final talk. Um, which I'm also really, really looking forward to by Sabilo Malambi, uh, who is a founder at Banchukrasi, a fellow at Stanford University, and a former fellow at the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy and the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society. His work focuses on decolonial AI and the use of African indigenous philosophy in shaping ethical AI policy and the production of ethical AI in Sub-Saharan Africa. Let us now welcome Sabilo. Thank you so much for the wonderful introduction. I've truly had a great time so far uh, listening to the presentation so far and uh, especially in how they include indigenous cultures and knowledge systems uh, when trying to understand AI and its impact on society. So I'd like to thank the organizers for the conference and uh, for giving us the tools to have this very important conversation. A good question to ask about artificial intelligence is why do we even have this technology in the first place? Well, we're destined to have artificial intelligence. Is it artificial intelligence? Is it truly human? And what gave rise to the idea that the machines could eventually match or surpass understanding and reasoning with little to no human intervention. Is that sensible? And if it is sensible, if it were sensible, why would having such a human machines be desirable at all? Will artificial intelligence really bring higher quality of human life and more fulfillment? In the next few minutes, I would like to explore the origins of society's relationship to artificial intelligence and how artificial intelligence relates to us today. In the matter of speaking truth and deal with our humans and how they categorize and classify humans and how humans should act and how the world should be designed and organized, how all of this became the foundation for artificial intelligence. Not only did these ideas become the foundation of AI, they became the foundation of Western economic, political, and social structures. They became the foundation of, for imperialism, colonization, slavery, and the genocide of non-Westerners. Early European philosophers would define personhood, um, the definition of what truly makes us human and what makes us distinct from other creatures, and what makes humans truly human. 
and they would define this as the ability to be rational. From Aristotle to the Enlightenment era philosophers, rationality was defined as the essence of personhood. European mathematicians, logicians would begin to work towards machines that they envisioned could become human-like. In other words, rational. The early logician Ramon Lau created what he called uh, the logic circle, which was a device that he believed could be used to convert Muslim infidels into Christianity. Leibniz, inspired by Lau and Aristotle's work on logic, also began envisioning some type of mathematical language or some type of alphabet that could represent every concept uh, in such a way that you can take these, this concept and put them into a machine, into some type of calculator. And through addition, subtraction, you would reach some type of result, some type of, some type of ground truth. Imagine, if you can, being able to compute who should receive financial loans, who should be denied bail, or who should be elected president. These were the ideas that, uh, that Leibniz was thinking about, solving conflicts through computation by representing every conceivable concept. Thomas Hobbes, another philosopher, also would say something quite similar. He would say that thinking is just computation. That thinking is really just addition and subtraction. And this idea would persist throughout, uh, throughout the decades, throughout the centuries, all the way to Alan Turing in the 1950s, where he would also describe artificial intelligence as just computers that can think. And again, his definition of thinking would just be simple, you know, addition and subtraction of ideas. So what's important about this and these early ideas of rationality of artificial intelligence? The main central theme is that, well, if machines are just simply using logic and if they're rational and they're just using mathematics, then how could they be biased, right? What could go wrong? However, there are very serious problematic uh, issues with, uh, with uh, this type of thinking. For example, how do you even measure what is rational, right? What exactly makes someone or something rational? And what metrics are used? And how is that measured or even defined? And what happens when multiple groups or cultures have different interpretations of rationality? Which version ultimately wins, right? Who gets to interpret the data? And the math alone, is it enough to really give us any ethical abilities? Is it enough to solve any moral decisions in a sufficient way? What history shows is, is that rationality was often defined in ways that would justify and advance European and American conquest. Rationality was defined in ways that would support capitalism, colonization, enslavement of Africans, and other human rights atrocities. The concept of rationality as a measure of who is human and how to be human served as a justification of the subjugation of non-American and the non-European. While it is obvious that racism is wrong, unjust, and can be deadly, it becomes to fight it when there is a framework that justifies racism. It becomes difficult to address racism, sexism, and other forms of discrimination in society when the leaders in society, those who, who hold power and influence over others, when the people that society trusts for guidance or direction also have created, created mechanisms to justify and approve of discrimination. Many of the Enlightenment era philosophers were these such people. They did provide the philosophical justification for the discrimination of others. And this justified how society should be organized, how the economy should be structured, and who should become the capital that will be solved in the creation of modern capitalism. The philosophers provided the justification for how power and resources should be distributed. Before rationality became the standard of proof, the standard of what's right, what's righteous, it used to be, it was religion, which was used to justify the very same atrocities Europeans would treat themselves as the representatives of, of God and earth, um, uh, with the papacy giving permission in 1452 for, uh, for the Portugal king, for example, to colonize the then known routes to the African continent, the then trading routes. And we'll see the same idea, the same, um, 
uh, idea where religion was now also being used to play this role in society where it justifies how power should be distributed, where it justifies how resources should be distributed, where it justifies who gets to control what parts of the world, who gets to colonize, who gets to dominate the trade systems, who gets to control and subjugate other people. And after religion, after rationality, there also was scientific racism. Again, this was the idea that biological differences within humans determined who was more or less of human. And based on these ideas, again, it would be determined, well, then how should we best distribute power and how should we best distribute resources? In all of these areas, there was always this, this, uh, uh, this structure, uh, a social role uh, either filled by scientific racism or this idea of perceived rationality or this idea that God has chosen one type of people to be the representatives of what's moral and just. And we see that in each of these eras, where, um, uh, they were, uh, these ideas were used to subjugate and to colonize and to, and to decide how power and resources should be distributed. The significant danger of artificial intelligence today is that it also falls into the same category, where it is used to play the role of a mediator, a proxy of truth, increasingly becoming the standard of correctness, of rightness. It is used as a cover in deciding how power and resources again should be distributed within society. Rationality is not neutral and artificial intelligence also based on, on these mythical ideas of rationality is not neutral either. Artificial intelligence, as we can see today, is being used to mask discrimination and to hide the underlying inequality within, this, within society. And it's used to justify the economic and social inequalities, the racism, the discrimination. AI is being used in society as sort of this accurate, logical, rational tool for making decisions, supposedly in a neutral manner. But it is just, again, the scapegoat uh, used to justify which community should be overly policed, who should be locked away in jail, who should be given or denied bail, and how long a person should serve a prison sentence. Uh, a prison, uh, prison sentence. It is being used to express society's beauty standards, favoring lighter skin over darker skin, for example. It is relied upon in deciding who should receive loans, who should receive loans at what rates. It is used to reflect the power structures that already exist in society. Yes, today we do know that the biased data that is used to create AI systems is very problematic. And the social structures that also result in only a few ethnicities, a few countries and corporations dominating the AI industry and its use around the world in ways that don't improve other societies. We know that, yes, this is problematic, but it is also equally as problematic, if not more so, the social role that artificial intelligence plays in being used to justify how power and resources are distributed within society. When AI is being used to justify the, uh, the inequality in society through the amplification of racism or modern colonization or systematic inequality, it gives this cover, this, this layer of protection, which sort of shifts the responsibility and shifts the true solutions to address inequality. And we start to believe this idea within society that, well, if the AI says it's correct, if the AI says it's true, well, it's a source of truth. Therefore, you know, the world is supposed to be the way that it is. But really, again, it's just another tool for this modern time used to simply justify how power uh, and resources are distributed in, in society. We must therefore realize that the distribution of power and resources, and resources in society affects who benefits from the tools that we create, such as artificial intelligence. And we must realize that the centralization of power often comes with the centralization of the benefits of technology. Having the capital, the capacity, the skill set to produce artificial intelligence determines who receives the benefits of artificial intelligence. If we ever move beyond artificial intelligence and finally do create better safety mechanisms, ethical frameworks uh, to govern artificial intelligence, data privacy laws, et cetera, et cetera, and maybe we even decide that we don't need artificial intelligence at all. We must be aware that the inherent danger and risk still remains. We must reasonably expect that another system will just arise and take up the same spot of artificial intelligence. Another system will arise to be used to justify yet again the distribution of power and resources within society. And this will continue as such 
until we begin to question the very nature of power and question what it truly means to be a person and how humans should react and relate to each other and how resources and power can be better distributed. And those who currently hold the power in the majority of the world's resources will, will have to find new ways. They will always find new ways to remain in power at the expense of others. Unless we begin to challenge these power relationships that we have observed for centuries, then we will continue reproducing the harms in society, whether it's through computation, through artificial intelligence, or some other futuristic system that we may envision yet again. To move therefore to a truly equitable world, we cannot continue using the same ideas and the same philosophies that have given us this very unequal world which we have today. When we begin to look beyond the, the traditional European American uh, Western philosophy, the conception of what the world should look like, that the conception that places rationality and individual and individualism at the very top of society as sort of the founding tents of, of, of society. When we begin to look beyond this traditional realm and begin to explore other types of thinking, cultures, uh, other, other types of knowledge systems and philosophies, then we may begin to find tools and ideas that are better positioned to give us really the world that we want, which is a world that is more equal, a world where we can have power and resources distributed more equally. And one such framework is the Ubuntu framework that we find in this in uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And essentially, you know, there is not enough time to describe Ubuntu uh, in such a short presentation. But it really, it is the idea that a person is not just rational. We're not just thinking rational beings, but more than that, we are relational. It is how we relate to each other, how we interact with each other that shapes who we are. How we create society, how we create civilization is not through just being logical, it's not just through thinking, but how we can share ideas, how we can co um, collaborate, how we can cooperate, how we can have and express compassion, how we can have shared ideas that we can work towards, and how we can have a shared goal and shared futures that we can work towards and give to. That in itself allows us to thrive as humans, whether as individuals or whether as, 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 as collectives. And we find these ideas within different indigenous philosophies all across the world that prioritize what we can do more together. And if we take some of these ideas and apply them to technology, then we might begin to envision uh, or even begin to realize a world that truly is more equal, that truly brings us to a, a, a place where we can have more equitable and more fair distribution of power uh, and, um, and resources within society. But if we don't question this, if we don't question the very foundation and the very philosophy, that uh, and the very ideas that have led to the systems that we have today, the systems of oppression, um, uh, we we're likely to repeat those same mistakes. So I'd like to end it um, on, on this note, and then maybe we can continue in the discussion with uh, uh, with further questions. Thank you so much, Sabelo. That was awesome. Um, I'm so so happy that we were able to hear. I think the majority of your talk. Um, yeah. So. Super, super important, very relevant. Um, and a lot of things that I'm hearing are echoes of kinship and relationality, and also perhaps even bringing Maya's work in with this idea of metaphorization as a, a kind of relation or this shared language and developed syntax as a kind of relation, um, or even through Jason's work, uh, kinship. Um, I just wanted to move through, we only have about 15 minutes left um, for questions and discussion. Um, so I just wanted to read through a few questions that we could meditate on and maybe um, we can have an organic response session and then open it up briefly to any audience um, who's here with us to ask questions. So I'm, I'm just going to move to the questions on survivance that I've prepared. Um, in a time where opacity, refusal, and ass assertion or agency of one's own data, for example, are so important, I'm curious about survivance, about how we survive through these colonial molds embedded within technology, how we obfuscate the white gaze or find safety. 
In this way, I'm curious how your work may motivate survivance. As we learn, according to Gerald Visener, who says in his book, Survivance Narratives of Native Presence, which is, quote, the motion of sovereignty and the will to resist dominance. And that, quote, survivance is also resistance. So I'm just gonna say that one more time. Survivance is the motion of sovereignty and the will to resist dominance. It is also resistance. And so I briefly just wanna ask, or generally ask, how, do you have examples um, of survivance in your critical or artistic processes in your work um, more generally? And what does that look like? Um, you know, because I'm hearing echoes of it again is through your different conversations or presentations that you had. Um, and I, I don't know if there's anybody on the panel that would like to start first. Please. Um, well, thanks for bringing us together and sort of um, putting this question of survivance. I like I hadn't heard of this word, and I'm very curious about it. And now I want to look it up. Um, that uh, and and not sort of survival or surviving. Um, I think I really appreciate the sort of diversity of voices and kind of cacophony in research and practice around this thing called AI, which I personally like to disrupt. And I see a lot of people disrupting in different ways to, um, part of it is to say, this is a thing that's there, mm -hmm. but it's also a thing that's not there. And we have a choice to, to decide how much value and power we want to give it. And I think it becomes a moment or just a locus or a point from which to start asking other questions about society and where we are now. So we're, we're talking about AI, but we're also talking about so many things that have come before that are already part of discussions and movements. So in my work, I am trying, and especially with the work on metaphors, none of this stuff is necessarily new. Uh, we have these modes of analysis. We have movements. We have infrastructures. We've been fighting many of these battles and raising a lot of these questions. So I actually find a lot of survivance, I think, in continuity in saying that we have those things that are there. How much is really new about this thing called AI and how much of it, um, uh, you know, to sort of respond to it, uh, we, we know how to do this. We have movements and networks that do this already, and we need to bring those together to newer challenges in this moment. This is, yeah, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, is there anybody, uh, Jason or Sabelo, who would like to sure. answer that? Uh, yes, I can go ahead. If I can navigate the, the lag here. Um, so I, I think the, uh, that point's a really, really great point about, you know, about what, what actually is new here, and there's really not a lot that's new here. Um, even the techniques uh, aren't that new, right? They were first developed in the 60s and 70s. Um, it's just that we have copy, it's just we have computational power now to, to realize them. Uh, but I think that it's what's one thing that's really critical is um, one of the things I find that is does feel different is it feels like there's in this this wave of say uh, technological innovation, which is uh, artificial intelligence. There's just a lot more brown people around. Right. So there's a lot more people uh, folks, uh, who are from the global south, uh, from Africa, from Asia, um, indigenous people who actually have some positions both in industry, but also uh, looking at the, the industry and at the research that's being done to, to sort of push back and so and, and start to mobilize existing networks uh, to Kind of take control of that technology to some extent and start figuring out how to build the technology in the ways that they would prefer to have it now there's always the issue you know of um you know just how far you can bend the technology that comes out of a particular western worldview how far you can bend it to really serve indigenous perspectives well uh, for instance uh, but i think you, we can bend it quite far and that in a certain way we don't have any choice like we can't we're not going to escape AI as it's being formulated now. It already touches our lives in so many different ways. So from my perspective, um, a big way of, of addressing this is building capacity within our communities 
uh, both on the technological level and also on the critical level. So, you know, uh, how to take long running critiques of how Western technology has been used against indigenous people, for instance, um, how to sort of uh, extend those to artificial intelligence so we can see it more clearly. But at the same time, how do we um, how do we make it possible so that we can try to build these technologies in ways that better serve our communities? And for me, that's the survivance aspect of it is, um, you know, do what we've always done, which is make uh, make these technologies our own. Uh, but I think we're just in a stronger position to do that than we have been in the past because it's, you know, even though there's still not enough of us in these conversations, uh, there's way more than there used to be, right? There was never a black in, you know, a black in, uh, you know, network technology group or an indigenous and in network technology group, right? Um, that's very different now than it has been in previous uh, technological waves, I would argue. Awesome. I, I can, I can mm -hmm. Yes. Um, when it comes to sur um, survival, survival um, something that I find really effective as well is this idea of community. And right now, we've been noticing an emerging movement, uh, probably that can be called um, decolonial AI, but also called the non alignment movement for AI. And this is really global South people saying, we don't want the, the US Western model of AI. At the same time, we don't want the, also the Eastern model, maybe the Chinese model of, of AI. We want to you know, envision our own technologies. We want to even be able to say, we don't want any technologies. We don't want AI. It's not a given that we should have artificial intelligence. And this is a movement similar to the 60s and 70s, where nations you know, were uh, resisting you know, excessive US Western pressure and also trying to resist uh, uh, you know, the ideals of um, uh, uh, communism and the Soviet Union uh, um, at that time. And so it's really encouraging and uplifting seeing communities that are willing to really actively resist uh, what's going on, uh, resist the technology and, res and resist the popular narratives. And also just simply say, you know what, we don't have to rely on other community, we don't have to rely on you know, the typical uh, uh, people in power to have these conversations. We can have them on our own, and we can imagine for ourselves a better world, and we can work, you know, within ourselves as well to try to achieve a better world. That's beautiful. Um, thinking about the um, this activeness um, and this way of starting this um, assertion through community. Um, yeah, which starts at home or, or which is more localized. So thank you um, to all of you for sharing your responses. Um, we just have a few minutes left and we have a question from a viewer that I would like to ask. It's not necessarily um, pointed toward a specific speaker. So I'll just read it. Um, how does the average consumer play a part in demanding accountability towards this kinship and artificial intelligence concepts. And I could read that one more time. How does the average consumer play a part in demanding accountability towards this kinship and AI concepts? Um, well, I, I would ask, um, what is this average consumer already doing to demand accountability for other aspects of the, you know, sort of big tech or tech data infrastructure that they're part of. I mean, this is just to sort of continue the point I was making before that um, there, there's lots of movements that are already out there that are, you know, sort of making demands, whether it's about data or rights to privacy. Um, just to share an anecdote, there was a, a couple of weeks ago, I got four emails from four different uh, fellow friends and researchers all saying, you know, can you share um, uh, studies or artworks or projects happening around feminist responses to, to AI? And my response was that, you know, there's, first of all, there's, there are some people who are doing this work, uh, but they're also part of larger movements. And they've also been doing work on, let's say, biometric identification or big data technologies. And we need to keep asking that the AI question as part of those questions. And I'm always emboldened when I see people who have 
come from various uh, different movements sort of making those connections. So I think this average consumer um, would need to sort of think about movements that are already existing and how they are addressing AI, how they are addressing community and care, um, where they are and, you know, do they have, and of course, some are more em uh, empowered to sort of talk about AI for various reasons. Uh, so I think that siloing is something that I see and I, I see as somewhat problematic. Uh, also the idea that, oh, we shouldn't talk about AI. I think in the South, sometimes you have this idea that, oh, it's all newfangled. It's all, it's not going to happen. Um, and, you know, AI is not as important as something else as, let's say, privacy. I don't actually see them as separate. I see them as part of the same sort of larger sort of apparatus, if you will. Yeah, ab absolutely. I do as well. Um, uh, we only have two minutes left uh, about. So if there's any short response <laughs> um, from any of you. Yeah, yeah. Just in a few uh, seconds, I just want, would, I would actually push back a little bit on that and say there is no average consumer. You every time to be called before based on uh, the called maybe exercises in society and the resources that we command. So it might be hard to uh, answer that quickly um, with the diversity of the people. Thank you so much um, for the answer, for your responses. Maya, thanks for being here in the studio with us. Thank you to the participants for moving through any delays and technical difficulties. I feel like Mercury is in retrograde, but it's not yet, just in my planets, apparently. Um, thank you to the crew here. Y'all, this would not happen without you. Um, I know I could imagine that you're working so hard to the people who clean the place, the people who bring the food, pour the water, do the COVID tests. Um, I see you and I'm so grateful for you and I'm grateful to be here and to have um, heard such wonderful and important work. Um, and I think that's it. Yeah, I think Ali is just going to close us out now. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Tiara, for those important words. Um, a massive thank you to Maya, Jason, Sabello for your imaginative and critical thought. And thank you, Tiara, for moderating the session and having patience with us as well. Um, I'm really glad that you were all able to join us this year. And a big thank you to the participants um, and audience for sticking with us. Um, so please do stick around. Um, there will be a little conversation with music journalist Ida Pakenejad coming up and our music program will begin this evening. You can find all of the info on our website. So thanks once again and hope to see you soon.